Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I am here today at the NFC, part of the Royal Armouries in Leeds, England, uh, courtesy of Ares, Armament Research Services. And we are going to take a look at the very first elements of the British L-85 rifle. So, in 1957, uh, NATO official, or the British adopted the FAL in 7.62 NATO. And this was kind of adopted against their general desires. This was seen by the British as being a rifle that was substantially too powerful. Uh, they had been pushing for an intermediate sized cartridge um, originally in the, in the EM2 rifle, and this was pretty much just rough trodden over by U.S. Ordnance Department, which insisted on a, a full power rifle cartridge, which would be the 7.62 NATO cartridge. Um, and because the U.S. had a lot of money and Europe was in financially troublesome straits after World War II, the U.S. got its way. Uh, so the British, having adopted the FAL in the guise of the SLR, the self-loading rifle, kind of knew that this was a more powerful infantry rifle than they thought was appropriate or suitable, and very quickly started working on a replacement for it. They experimented with a number of different cartridges. There was a 6.25 millimeter cartridge that was worked on, um, a number of 276 and 7 millimeter cartridges, and all the way down to, they were conceivably looking as small as 4 millimeter. And at the beginning of what would become the L85, or SA80, small arms of the 1980s, uh, th the project actually began with a look at calibers. Now, some of the fundamental ideas for SA80 were they wanted to have a, an individual rifle and a light support weapon, which were largely parts interchangeable, or at least, well, at this point, they didn't even know if they were going to be ammunition interchangeable. But one of the ideas was we have differing cartridge requirements for these two types of guns. We want the individual shoulder rifle to be a relatively small caliber, something that has light recoil. You know, the effective range only needs to be a couple hundred yards, as everybody learned in World War II, that this rifle combat wasn't happening beyond three or four hundred yards. So why bother having a cartridge? effective out to 800 if you never actually made use of it. Better to have a small caliber cartridge, faster follow-up shots, lighter ammunition to carry, lighter ammunition to transport logistically, and you get all the effectiveness out of it that you really need. However, the light support weapon, or the light machine gun, or the squad automatic weapon, all basically different names for the same thing, that weapon did have a longer effective range because it was firing fully automatic from a bipod, and you could engage a target at 600 yards with it. So it did deserve or it could exploit the power of a slightly heavier cartridge. So when the British started working on what would become SA-80, they had a number of different decisions to make. And one of the very first ones was, what cartridge do we use? And do we use the same cartridge in both guns? So for example, we could use a five millimeter cartridge in both guns, which would be ideal for the rifle, but it would leave the machine gun a little bit underpowered. Or we could use, say, a 7 millimeter cartridge in both, which would be ideal for the machine gun, but overkill for the rifle. Um, they had four different types of, of comparisons like this. What they ended up deciding on was to use a 4.85 millimeter cartridge for both weapons. And that would become the 4.85 by 49 millimeter developed by the British and actually tested by NATO. We'll get to that in a moment. Now, with the cartridge decided, the next question is, what configuration do we make the rifle in? And again, there were four different options considered, or several different um, yes, no, you know, binary decisions that all kind of add up into a bunch of different end options. You had a, a standard configuration long rifle, or you could make it a bullpup. Bullpup, of course, meaning that the trigger mechanism and the magazine, or the magazine is located behind the trigger mechanism, as you see on all of these guns. Uh, you could make it with a straight stock or a dropped stock. Um, a dropped stock would be something like the FAL, where the sights are very low on the barrel, and in order to get a, a good sight picture down those sights, you have the stock dropped lower. That's a traditional configuration. Versus a straight stock, something like an AR-15, where the stock is directly in line with the bore, which means that you have less muzzle climb when you fire, because the recoil energy is coming straight in and not, not leveraged up. Um, however, that means that your sights have to be lifted much higher off the barrel in order to be able to physically get a sight picture. So they had this whole table of options to choose from. And what they ended up deciding on was a bullpup straight line stock. And this 
is the very first mock-up of this weapon that was put together. This is a wooden mock-up of the gun. It's got a wooden mock-up of the scope with a hole drilled through it so you can see through it. And this is what they envisioned at this point at RSAF Enfield, uh, Royal Small Arms Factory Enfield, which was responsible for British military firearms development. That's what they decided to build. Now around this same time, they put together a couple prototypes, a couple experimental dummy guns just as proofs of concept. And what they actually did was build one out of a, uh, a Sterling made AR-180 rifle, and they also built one out of a Stoner 63 rifle. So we'll take a look at those two in just a moment. And there is an interesting story here that this is actually a story that's going to be relevant all the way through development of the L85 slash SA-80, which is that they basically ended up copying the AR-180 design, but they did so without any developmental input from Sterling or Armalite, and really kind of a, um, an unfortunate way, they basically stole the idea from Sterling, didn't give them any recognition or any, uh, any legal compensation. And so Sterling was rather annoyed with this, and at one point they put together their own bullpup version just kind of to show how incredibly similar it was to what Enfield was making. So knowing all of that, let's take a quick look at a couple of these specific guns because these really are the very beginning of what would become SA-80. So this is the original wooden prototype, or one of a couple, but it's, I believe, the only surviving uh, wooden prototype example. And this actually bears a remarkably close similarity to the final end product, which we don't always get with wooden mock-ups. You'll notice that it does come with an optical sight. That was one of the decisions early on in the planning process, is that the new rifle would be standard fitted with an optical sight. And that would turn out to be really one of the strengths of the entire program. It is, of course, also a bullpup configuration. We have a magazine behind, magazine and action, behind the, the fire control group here. Note here that they have, on the prototype, they have a lever safety. That's something that we'll see come up in the later development of this, development and, and iterations of the rifle, is how they actually wanted to do the safety. Also note that the sling swivels are located on the very top of the action. The magazine catch, Interestingly, for a prototype, it does have a removable magazine. The mag catch is located on the back of the magazine. Uh, those are all features that would change back and forth over the, the life cycle of this program. So moving from this, one of the next steps was to build some developmental, just proof of concept, functional rifles. So here is one of those very, very first proof of concept prototype rifles. This was actually built literally on, from an AR-180 rifle made by Sterling. Now, what's interesting is this was not acquired from Sterling. You'd think the natural way to do a project like this would be to go to the people making the rifle, who obviously know how to make the rifle and have the expertise, and say to them, you know, golly, we, we like the design and we'd like to use this as the basis for something new. Can you give us some technical assistance to make sure that it goes over well? Now, mechanically, the conversion of this to a bullpup is actually fairly simple. Um, the receiver stays the same. Of course, they removed the buttstock. The only real difficulty is, of course, moving the trigger group. And for a proof of concept gun like this, the way they did that was to manufacture a new housing here, which is kind of just spot welded into place or tack welded into place, and then to connect the trigger to the actual fire control group, well, they just used a long wire that connects from the trigger up here back to the working bits of the gun. Uh, obviously, that's not something you would do in a a production gun, but that's all it took for something simple like a proof of concept here. You'll notice we still have the original Armalite style uh, dog-like bolt handle, Armalite dust cover. All the rest of these bits are clearly Armalite parts, or Sterling made parts. So another of the proof of concept guns that was done at this same time period was built on a Stoner 63 because, well, they had it. Um, so you'll notice this is a standard Stoner 63 magazine. Of course, these proofs of concept guns uh, were done in 5.56 because they, they weren't going to spend the time and, and engineering to change the caliber of these guns. Um, they were just done as demonstrations to, you know, what it, what's this rifle actually kind of sort of going to handle like when we're done? And that's a, a perfectly valid thing to do here. You'll see we have another of these wires coming out the back around the, the magazine well in order to connect the trigger up here to the actual firing mechanism at the back, 
because that's all left alone. The selector switches are left alone. You can see this stud right here. This was originally the pistol grip screw on the stoner. This is where the trigger was, and they've covered that with a little metal plate. So a pretty quick and, quick and dirty conversion. Uh, the scope on this, believe it or not, this is a scope. That's actually the scope off of an EM-2 rifle. It's what was called a unit scope. It was uh, non-magnifying, but optical, and had a crosshair. And the idea for that scope was based in the fact that with a bullpup rifle, you potentially had a very short sight radius. And it was more, it gave you much more effective aimed fire to have an optical sight rather than iron sights. Interestingly, the stoner proof of concept also has a much heavier barrel and it has a bipod mounted onto it. And uh, this is, I think, a foreshadowing of the idea that they were going to be building both an infantry weapon and a light support weapon uh, model of the guns. So this acts as a proof of concept of the light support weapon. Longer, heavier barrel, bipod for more accurate long range fire. Now lastly, one other gun that I want to take a look at because it was here in the collection is this other Bullpup AR-18. Now this is actually an AR-180. It is semi-automatic only. And this was basically an annoyed project from the Sterling Company when they did discover that their design had been taken for the SA-80 project. Uh, the, the government denied that they had simply copied the Sterling AR-180 and Sterling said, well, clearly you did. Here, we'll just throw one together with some scrap bits that we have and put together this, which is basically the exact same gun. Uh, now on this one, they actually did not even bother to make it a functional gun, so there is no connection between the trigger group and the firing mechanism. But uh, this, by the way, didn't get them any, any progress or any ground or any, didn't have any effect, but they were annoyed and they built it, and it remains here in the NFC collection. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. These are some very cool one-of-a-kind prototypes that we got to take a look at today. If you're interested in taking a look at these yourself, um, they are all available at the Royal Armory's uh, National Firearms Center, and that is a location that is available by appointment. It's not open to the public, but if you are doing serious research on this type of firearm or any, anything else along these lines, definitely contact them, make an appointment, tour the facility, see the things. And if you would like more information on these particular guns, make sure to take a look at the Armament Research Services website and blog, where we'll have some high-resolution photos of each of these. Thanks for watching.